Good evening. It is April 5th, 2022. Time is 6.32. Welcome to this meeting of the Hingham Select Board. We will begin the meeting with a Pledge of Allegiance, and I will call on our Army Reserve Officer, Bill Ramsey, to lead us. Great. Please stand and face the flag of our nation. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Bill. item on our agenda. I got that. Next item on our agenda is approval of minutes. We have three minutes we're considering this evening, March 15th, March 16th, and March 22nd. March was a banner year for us. <laughs> so I'm prepared to move forward with all three. Liz? I'm prepared. Bill? I'm prepared. And I'm prepared to accept the motion. Make a motion to approve the minutes dated March 15, 2022. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 None opposed. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes dated March 16, 2022. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. None opposed. And finally, the minutes for March 22nd. I'd make a motion to approve the minutes dated March 22, 2022. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Approved. Wonderful. Next item on our agenda is to consider voting to confirm the postponement of the 2022 Town of Hingham annual election to May 14th, 2022, pursuant to Chapter 36 of the Acts of 2022. At a prior meeting, we voted to postpone the annual election, but we were waiting for the state legislature to act. They have acted. Uh, and so I'm now going to consider confirming our prior vote to postpone the election to May 14th. Any discussion? Liz? No discussion, no, no questions. Any member of the public? Then I'm ready to accept a motion. I will make a motion to confirm the postponement of the Town of Hingham annual election from Saturday, April 30th, 2022, from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. to Saturday, May 14th, 2022, from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. pursuant to chapter 36 of the Acts of 2022. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And aye. It's unanimous. Next item on our agenda is to consider approval of the special one-day wine and malt beverages license to Sharon Bowen on behalf of the South Shore Conservatory for the performance of adult concert and reception to be held at the South Shore Conservatory on Saturday, April 6, 2022, from 6 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. Is Sharon here? Sharon, just give us a brief description of what's being proposed, and you, if you can go out to the podium so that the world can, can see and hear you. Yeah. Okay. Um, Thank you. So basically, we have got a two and a half day fundraising event at South Shore Conservatory this weekend. Um, it's actually the 9th, not the 6th. It's Saturday the 9th. Um, and I work as the donor relations manager in the development department. Um, and we are just having some of our adult students come in to the conservatory on Saturday evening. We're just going to set it up cabaret style with some wine and, and cheese and crackers and desserts and things like that. Very informal. They will get up on stage and, you know, perform something. And what's your estimate of attendance? We were kind of hoping for 65, but right now it looks like more like 45. Would you like us to drum up some support? So <laughs> yes, please. Anybody's welcome. <laughs> Absolutely. So. Um, sounds like a delightful evening. Uh, Chief, have you reviewed the application? I have, yes. And? No issue. Great. Thank you. Liz, any questions? No questions. Sounds like a great event. Bill? No questions. I know that you know, commonly do fundraisers at the conservatory, so I'm yes. sure this is going to be similar to that. So yes, it best is. Best of luck with the event. Yes. Thank you very much. 
and you'll see me again for because we've plenty more coming up over the summer I hope. Right. <laughs> so if people want more information where can they go to get that? They can go to the website sscmusic.org or I mean if anybody wants my email I'm happy to give my email to anyone too. I think the website is, is good. Yeah the email's on the application actually. Great. Yeah. Are there any members of the public with comments or questions? Seeing none I'm prepared to take a motion. I'd make a motion to approve the request for a special one-day wine and malt beverages license to Sharon Bohan on behalf of the South Shore Conservatory for the perform Performathon Adult Concert and Reception to be held at the South Shore Conservatory on Saturday, April 9th, 2022, from 6 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. Second. Moved and seconded. We vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. It's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you all. Next item on our agenda is to consider the amendments to the Town of Hingham COVID-19 temporary policy regarding restaurant outdoor table service, including but not limited to extending the term of the policy and extending existing OTS approvals and related sidewalk licenses and I see that we have the town's real estate council Susan Murphy here and if you would please walk us through what's being proposed yes yeah, so the town uh, the, the town originally adopted the select board originally adopted this policy in 2020 in response to Governor Baker's executive orders establishing the outdoor table service um, that it was at the time it was because restaurants were not permitted to serve customers inside um, they were trying to help keep their restaurants afloat um, it's been very popular um, both with the restaurant owners and with the public um, it the, the major uh, change with this which has now been codified through an act of the legislature is that it overrides local zoning so when dining got expanded to be on sidewalks or in parking lots etc um, and could potentially impact um, things like parking safety etc um, the the governor's order and now the act uh, puts it on the chief executive officer in this case the select board and hang them to establish the policy and review the applications um, the town had set up uh, what was known as or is known as the restaurant reopening group which was made up of various town officials from planning building public safety board of health to review the applications at the time and to make recommendations to the select board the select board had um, issued 14 of these approvals between 2020 and 2021 um, it was set to expire on April 1st last week last Friday on April 1st the governor signed legislation which extended the authority of the select board to grant and extend these approvals until April 1st 2023 uh, however the original policy that the board adopted still referenced the state of emergency all of the right. COVID um, social distancing requirements both state and local um, and also you know the had expiration dates based off the state of emergency etc so in with the passage of the recent extension by the legislature we revisited the policy to substantially update it to reflect the current state of the law um, and also to address a few issues which um, are, are raised by continuing this policy of overriding zoning for example as we mentioned at the time there was no indoor dining so having outdoor dining was not an impact on uh, things like septic systems however if restaurants are going to be going potentially full capacity indoors and have this extended capacity outdoors um, about five of the businesses are in septic systems there's concerns of the Board of Health that they're not overtaxing septic systems. so there's there's trade-offs you know there's the, you know the the, uh, the the bad with the good here of extending what what is a very popular policy 
So what's before the board tonight is to adopt the amended policy um, and also to extend a number of uh, OTS approvals. I can uh, walk through what, what they are for the various uh, businesses, if you'd like me to, um, and to propose some you know, new or additional conditions to the existing permits in order to cover any concerns that arise now that everyone's fully open at full capacity. Um, so I, I think what makes sense is you, you, there's two separate votes here. Uh, yes. And the first one is the policy and the right. second one is gonna get more specific. So we can talk about the policy. Um, and I, you've touched on a number of the topics that I was um, going to ask about, but let me, I'll give you all the topics and then you tell me which okay. ones you want to respond. Uh, first uh, is the reaction that restaurants have had to our policy, whether it meets their needs. Second, um, the impact on neighbors, because if, if a restaurant is perhaps using sidewalk space that might interfere with other businesses, their uses, whether or not that's been an issue. Um, parking, whether or not there's sufficient parking to support um, the expanded uses here, um, and then finally septic, which you've you've, you've touched on. Right. So, so all was, of it was oh. the restaurants, the neighbors, parking, and septic were the four topics. Right. So all of those topics, um, with the caveat that now we're talking about potential full capacity indoors and outdoor, but all of those topics were touched upon by. Um, the town officials that were part of the uh, restaurant reopening group. Um, I'm not aware, and I hate to put the chief on the spot here, but I'm not aware of complaints with respect to any of the outdoor dining. But neither am I. Yeah. Yeah. You don't have them, no. yeah. So as far as we know, there's been no either resident or a butter complaints uh, with the operation for the last two or so years that they've they've been in effect. Um, the the parking, it may be on a case by case basis. I think, you know, right now, the permits have all, the approvals have always had conditions that said that additional conditions may be imposed for uh, public safety purposes of, um, that would relate to parking as well. So if, if it does appear that with any of these businesses kind of in full, and, and not only these businesses being in full operation, but now if they're in shopping centers, et cetera, all of the businesses around them are now in full operation. Uh, the town does have the ability if any problems start arising, um, if you know your office, the police department get any calls that that business could be asked to meet with town officials and if necessary, come back to the board to talk about how to adjust that. Uh, with respect to septic system, Susan Sarney, uh, the town's health officer, it has been in the loop in the emails the last couple of days with uh, Sharon Perfetti, who, as you know, um, works for the board on all the liquor license issues, in order to um, determine whether or not the, the all these the the five restaurants that are on septic systems will be able to operate at full capacity indoors and outdoors. So one of the conditions that is proposed for the board is a specific call out saying that notwithstanding issuance of an OTS approval, the actual seating may be limited by the Title V restrictions. Um, Susan Sarney has also asked that for those businesses on septic that a cover letter go out with their extensions stating that they need to communicate with her office in order to confirm that they have adequate septic capacity for the number of seats that they hope to operate. So that's one of the adjustments that's being made. Are there any adjustments from a public safety standpoint? In other words, the barriers to keep cars from going into where people are dining, are they sufficient? Do they need to be redesigned? Or is that something that's more case by case as we go through the list? Currently, the, the extensions are only being granted to allow the outdoor dining that was originally approved for each of these businesses. At that time, all of the safety barriers were reviewed right. by public safety and, you know, and it was approved by the board at that time. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that Sharon is reaching out to the restaurants that if they have modified or hope to modify right. what they're doing, they have to get in touch with her. And if there's any modifications to the plan, they would go 
back through the restaurant reopening group and potentially have to come back to the board. But everyone should be operating under their original plans. No one's been given permission to modify their plans. Um, so, you know, we'll have to see how, how those play out this season. So I'm going to turn it over to my fellow board members, but I, I do want to say that the comments that I've received from members of the public has just been exceptionally positive. Uh, they enjoy the experience. I know the restaurants do, and uh, looking forward to making this happen. Liz. Excellent. Thank you. Yes, all of the feedback that I've received has been extremely positive um, for restaurant owners and, and certainly people that live here and dine here and, and visit. So thrilled to see this um, continuing. I was going to ask about the septic. I know that applies to the range and there are four other restaurants that that mm -hmm. applies to. Um, as far as ADA compliance, has that Thanks. I'm sure you've covered that, but can you just speak to that a little bit? All right, so the, the building commissioner oversees ADA compliance, mm -hmm. uh, particularly with the sidewalks. Yes. Um, he, you know, when they came in with their plans, they were required to show the necessary width mm -hmm. for wheelchair accessibility, and that also obviously assists people with strollers and, and to make sure people can pass each other. Um, you know, in some instances, there was a little bit of stretching of areas, <laughs> but when those uh, businesses were spoken to, they pulled things back as necessary. So it's, I think it's been a pretty um, cooperative mm -hmm. uh, exercise. Obviously, I'm not involved in that directly, but I work closely with the town officials, and I know if there's been issues, they've worked with the restaurants, and, everything, and issues have been resolved. Great. So. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so yeah, no other questions. It, just to it, confirm, this is just a one-year extension, and there's no fees associated with it for the Correct. restaurants. Correct. Bill, uh, just a couple comments. Um, you know, I did. I think this is a wonderful program. So thank you for your work on this, Susan. Um, the the ability of restaurants to complete uh, increase their capacity through this program has been a major plus for the restaurants that have taken advantage of it. Uh, patrons um, that have been able to eat outside, particularly in the summertime and the warm summer nights, have loved the program. Um, the restaurants in the square that have utilized this program have really uh, added to the ambiance of the square. Um, I think it's a really nice addition to have uh, this program in place in the downtown area and other parts of town. So it's, it's been really successful for our town to have this in place. Um, one thing um, I would like to add that it's, it, is, it is a one-year extension and I'm grateful for the legislature for doing this, but it is a one-year extension. We've had two restaurants come in who have gone through the permitting process so far. Um, it's gonna require um, a special permit from the, probably from the zoning board, from the planning board. Um, you probably will need a permit from us as well. And they've gone through the process and they've been able to uh, increase this program in perpetuity. Those restaurants that haven't done that, uh, this is only going to be for a year. I don't think the legislature will increase this program beyond April of 23. So if you're a restaurant owner and this is a program that you like taking advantage of, I would once again encourage you to use this year to reach out to our, our permitting staff to um, start this process. The year goes by fast. Um, our permitting staff has been extremely user-friendly to restaurants and helping them guide them through the process. Like I said, we've had two restaurants go through it already. Um, they've already successfully completed uh, the process itself. They've been we're very happy with the results. Um, so do not wait until March of 23 to start the process because in April they will not have the permits in place. So Great to see this in place. I'm thankful for the legislature for increasing it again. And like I said, it's just it's so nice to, you know, to go walk in a downtown area and just to hear the, the soft noise of people enjoying dinner and have those seats in place and just thrilled that we're going to continue to enjoy this program. So thank you. Absolutely. Maybe we can have uh, one of our select board meetings outdoors <laughs> at one of these yeah. restaurants. To be fair, we'd have to do every one of the restaurants. Well, that, uh, <laughs> uh, absolutely. We have a lot of good restaurants in town. Um, so at this point, I'll open it up to members of the public if they have questions with, related to the policy that is before us concerning outdoor seating. I am 
Seeing none, so I'm prepared to take a the first vote uh, that's before us this evening. I will make a motion that the board amend the Town of Hingham COVID-19 temporary policy regarding restaurant outdoor table service in its entirety in the form of the draft dated April 5th, 2022. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 That's unanimous. And again, just emphasizing Bill's point and what Liz just said as she read the motion, this is a temporary policy. And if there are restaurants looking for more permanent relief, go through the permitting process. Bill has been a strong advocate to make that happen. Uh, looking forward to more restaurants taking advantage. So now we proceed to the second vote that concerns specific restaurants. And Susan, if you could walk us through that. Right, so as I mentioned, there are 14 approvals that the board has given to date. Um, I just wanted to break down for the board what's in front of you because not all 14 of those are being extended tonight for different reasons. So the first one is the Square Cafe. As you know, the Square Cafe has already gone through planning and zoning, and they've already been in front of this board, and they have been granted by the ABCC a permanent modification um, rather than the temporary one, which the OTS. So they are good to go. They are operating now. They don't need an OTS approval anymore. Um, Legal C Bar and Localis Tacos has gone, have gone through planning and zoning as well. Um, they, ha I believe they're coming in front of the board to have approval of a permanent modification of their liquor license. Um, and so temporarily until that is approved by this board and then goes to the ABCC, they still need an OTS permit. So they are on the list for tonight, but once they get the 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 final approvals they will they they'll no longer be operating under OTS they'll be under their regular liquor license. Um, there's a number. Um, let me count here: one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So there's ten others um, in addition to those two um, that are coming that are going to be extended if the board so votes tonight. Uh, five of them have septic systems, so they'll be notified that they have to um, reconcile that with the Board of Health and their septic systems. Um, it probably wouldn't be too pleasant to be sitting outside if you have a septic system that's failing anyway, so it's probably in everybody's interest that that get addressed. Um, so those, those restaurants are, um, are also, I believe that uh, Sharon's also in, going to be in touch or has been in touch with these restaurants to let them know that they need to operate under their existing plans and any changes have to come to the town. Um, if the board votes to extend their approvals, they'll get an extension. For, they'll get an extension of their permit, a written extension. So um, General will be in touch with them. There's one establishment, Brood Awakenings, down in the square. They were issued an OTS permit. Um, but if, if um, I'll reference the definition of outdoor table service under the act, it is only for restaurants that serve seated customers at their table. So it has to be wait service, um, a wait person, and they do not have that. Um, I understand that, um, that Sharon Perfetti has been in touch with the owner or potentially a future owner who might want to put a number of tables outside and they're being advised that they just need to come to the select board to get a sidewalk license. Mm -hmm. um, so that would have to be handled through a different process. So they are not on the list for an extension tonight. Okay. Very thorough. Uh, Liz, any questions? Um, can you just tell us the other ones that are on septic? The ones that are on septic are um, the two at the Derby Street shops, so Legal C and uh, Burton's, the South Shore Sports Center, um, the Range, and Vita Mexicana is up at Queen Anne's Corner. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, to the extent that some of these may or may not even take advantage of the outdoor, that's one of the things that you know Sharon in your office is mm -hmm. is, is going to confirm and try to and figure out the extent to which the businesses plan on right. utilizing this this year. Okay. Great, thank you. Well, I know additional questions, thank you. 
Um, I just want to confirm with the chief that our, you're not aware of any reasons that any of these sp specific restaurants um, have raised public safety issues, uh, either police or fire? Right, as far as I'm aware, none. Okay, great. Any member of the public with comments or questions concerning uh, outdoor table service for the restaurants? I am seeing none. I'm prepared to take a motion. Make a motion that the board amend the outdoor table service approvals granted to the following establishments by extending the expiration date of each OTS approval to expire on April 1st, 2023, the rescission date, provided, however, that if the rescission date is extended by the legislature, the rescission date shall be such the extended date unless the select board in its discretion sets an earlier expiration date and subject to the following additional general conditions. One, this extension is granted subject to the approval plan previously approved and attached to or referenced in the original OTS approval. Any modification to the location, size, layout or seating capacity of the OTS premises from the original approval approved plan is subject to review and approval by the select board. Two, this OTS approval as extended is subject to all other applicable federal, state and local laws, regulations and permits without limiting the foregoing and notwithstanding the grant of this OTS approval the establishment shall be subject to any restriction on total indoor and outdoor seating capacity pursuant to Title V of the State Environmental Code. Four, except as expressly modified herein, all general conditions and special conditions of the original OTS approval and prior extensions thereof remain in full force and effect. Five, the establishment may be subject to periodic inspection for compliance with this approval. Fail failure to comply with this approval may result in suspension or revocation of this approval and in fines in accordance with Massachusetts law. 99 Restaurants of Boston, LLC, doing business as 99 Restaurant and Pub. Shipyard Ventures, LLC, doing business as Almanove. MCC4LBD LLC doing business as Boathouse Bistro. Burton's Grill of Hingham LLC doing business as Burton's Grill. Legal Seafoods LLC doing business as Legal Sea Bar. Locales Taco LLC doing business as Locales Tacos e Tequila. Lima Sports. Incorporated, doing business as South Shore Sports Center. The Range Hingham, LLC, doing business as The Range. B.E. and E. Incorporated, doing business as The Snug. Eat Well, Inc., doing business as Tosca. Plaza Azteca Hingham, do, Incorporated, doing business as Vida Mexicana. Paragon Funding Group, LLC, doing business as Wahlburgers. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. It's unanimous. Susan, thank you very much. Very thorough. And we wish uh, the restaurants well. We wish that they prosper. And uh, we're all looking forward to dining there. How are we doing? No, perfect. Next item on our agenda is to consider approval of the petition from a national grid to install and maintain approximately 64 feet of four inch gas main in Downer Avenue. And I believe we have our town engineer, J.R. Fry, here. Good evening. Good evening. This is new. <laughs> yes, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, town engineer, J.R. Fry. Um, and we're having no problems with the connection with you. This is, this is perfect. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> um, does the select board have the plans? We do. Okay. Um, do you need a copy? For I don't. Okay. Um, 
ultimately what this is is a continuation of work that National Grid has already initiated on Thaxter Street. However, due to the poor condition of the pipe that was identified in the roadway, they were unable to reconnect as they originally planned. And because of uh, the extent and length, as well as crossing state highway layout and entering um, a new right of way for the town that was not previously referenced, uh, we thought it would be best practice to uh, obtain a grant of location uh, for this location as well. Uh, it is required and that's why we kind of expedited it as quickly as possible because um, as soon as they get this approval, they will be able to gas up the new main and begin connecting services. And so um, typically there are pre-construction meetings and I'm just seeing that it's not planned for, for this particular project. Correct? It is not planned for this particular project because it's, it's, they're in progress. Yep. Um, and have uh, affected abutters been notified? The uh, affected abutters have been notified, so those would be the immediate abutters, sure. as well as Foster School has been notified directly, and we worked with um, the Transportation Department of the School District to uh, spe specify specific times that uh, the road must be open for the passage of school buses and people dropping off um, children yep. and picking up. Um, and I'm not commenting on this particular project, but I know in other projects when they put the steel plates down, sometimes mm -hmm. it's, it's rough on people's vehicles. Uh, what, what are the plans for that? Uh, they know that uh, when they put plates down, they're required to notify us. They're required to ramp those plates right. and pin them in place. Um, I'm not, I don't anticipate that they will need to do that for this, and they should be um, in and out in about two days. Oh, great. Liz, any questions? Thank you, JR. And I know the work on Thaxter is happening as we speak, so when, when do they expect to do this work on Downer? They had hoped to begin it last week. Okay. So th they, do, they also need to come all the way across uh, uh, Lincoln Street, where it's, where it's State Highway layout, um, I was uh, told that they ha their uh, working relationship with MassDOT is such that they were given verbal authorization to proceed with that work, and so um, I've got a copy of that email. <laughs> okay. Okay, great. Well, uh, thank you for, for working with the school department mm -hmm. in, in terms of Foster. So, uh, so it's going to be two days? Uh, approximately. Okay. Because I know that is, I mean, that Lincoln Downer, Broad Cove, that's probably one of the ma most major intersections in town. Sure. The, you've, got that, you've got those four roads converging there. Yep. Um, most of the work that we're discussing is going to be on, um, just on da the Downer F side. We're not really discussing the state highway layout. They may choose to do that per their typical working arrangement which may be an evening operation or something to avoid significant traffic disruption. Okay, so are they gonna do the work in the intersection itself or just on the downer ave side? They'll have to do work all the way through the intersection. They'll be tying into mains on both sides, the north side and south side of Lincoln Street, as well as tying into the main on downer. Okay, well that's good to hear that, that if they do work in the intersection would be in the evening. That would disrupt I, that is I can't effect. guarantee that, but I would imagine that that is what MassDOT will look for. Okay, great. Thanks, Chair. Um, Tom, question for you. Yep. Um, is there any budget impact on the town with nope. this work? None. Okay, thank you. Are there any members of the public, comments or questions concerning the gas, man repl gas main replacement quest on Downer Ave from Thaxter Street? Seeing none, I'm prepared to accept the motion. I will make a motion to approve the request of National Grid to install and maintain approximately 64 feet of four inch gas main in Downer Avenue. This work is an extension of the work currently in progress in Thaxter Street and is necessary to complete that work. 
The gas main in Downer Avenue will originate at the intersection of Downer Avenue and Lincoln Street as a continuation of the gas main in Thaxter Street crossing Lincoln Street, connecting into the existing four inch plastic gas main in Downer Avenue. These gas mains will replace existing three inch bare steel. The age of the abandoned main is 83 years old. This approval is subject to the stipulations of the Department of Public Works as outlined in the letter dated May 31st, 2022. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. That is also unanimous. Thank you, JR, I appreciate it. Next item on our agenda, and you can stay there, <laughs> um, on the hot seat, uh, is to consider approval of the petition from the Massachusetts Department of Transportation to install MBTA bus system infrastructure improvements to improve accessibility at the intersection of Otis Street and Governor Long Road. And then I notice that we have a companion item before us to consider approval of the petition of the uh, Massachusetts Department of Transportation to install MBTA bus system infrastructure improvements to improve accessibility at the intersection of Otis Street and Broad Cove Road. So I think both of those items are before us. Um, if you could uh, bring us up to speed, JR, because we, uh, this board already had a, a, a hearing on the uh, intersection of uh, Otis and Broad Cove, mm -hmm. and now we have that coming back as well as one for Otis Street and Governor Law. Yes, so. Uh, and we do have the packets. Great. Um, so we approached you originally with uh, a couple separate um, intersections where MBTA was proposing to do improvements to improve accessibility as part of their PADI project. Um, and uh, Natasha will explain more about that in a moment. Uh, Natasha Vance and Corinne Tobias are here from the MBTA, so they'll be able to talk a little bit more about that. But as to the process, um, we brought those before you and uh, there was uh, one location that uh, did not have any objection, and we were able to move forward with that. Yes. And there was, uh, and the location at uh, Otis and Broad Cove had um, some significant questions that were raised during the public meeting. So we did proceed with uh, discussing the concerns with several of the residents. Um, we also had several uh, traffic committee meetings on this subject to review uh, what our options were in terms of proposed design and what we could do to mitigate the um, issues related to that particular intersection. And so through the course of those, the traffic committee approved um, Im improved a rec approved a recommendation to uh, make significant improvements at, and, and MBTA has agreed to proceed with these improvements at the intersection of Broad Cove Road and Otis Street. Uh, these improvements would advance um, a design that was prepared as part of the Route 3A improvement project and significantly improves the safety of that intersection by slowing down vehicles that are approaching uh, Otis Street northbound and where they can currently uh, drive straight up the road without slowing down at all, um, they will have to uh, make a proper right turn uh, onto, um, onto Otis Street now and that movement will reduce their speeds I believe the design speed on that curve is about 15 to 20 miles an hour. So there will be, they, all of these vehicles um, will be forced physically to slow down in order to make that curve safely. Uh, so along all of these improvements that the MBTA is, uh, has agreed to make um, roughly three years in advance of what we would otherwise achieve with the Route 3A project uh, include a significant amount of uh, new curb installation, um, creating a bump out uh, to both focus and 
uh, direct the traffic appropriately and to um, reduce the apparent width of the roadway for road users so that they do not have the feeling that they have all of that real estate to utilize. Um, and then in addition to that, obviously they'll be uh, installing uh, sidewalk, uh, ADA compliant ramps, um, removing and reloc or relocating the existing traffic island uh, to meet the geometric requirements of the intersection and uh, making sure that the actual stops, which are up the road from Broad Cove, uh, some 60 to 80 feet, uh, that those stops meet their requirements by providing a landing area and clear zone for their buses to operate. Could you talk a little bit about um, the accessibility issues and what's being done to, to make them more accessible? And I don't know if you want to have uh, Sure, Corinna I think at this time to... it's appropriate yeah. to invite Natasha Vance and Please. Corinne Price. Um, hello. Yeah. Hi, if you can just introduce yourself sure. so that we all know who you are. Sure. I'm Natasha Vance. I work for the MBTA. I'm the project manager for the PADI project. Um, PADI stands for the Plan for Accessible Transit Infrastructure. The scope of the project is to take inaccessible bus stops, such as the ones that we're discussing here, and make them accessible. Um, as, as JR mentioned, we are um, looking at four different bus stops in the town of Hingham. We have approval for one. Um, there were some significant safety concerns at, for Otis and Broad Cove. Um, we looked at the design of 3A and we're going to incorporate um, all of those elements in to slow down traffic um, to make it safer for people who are making the turn, anyone who's walking across that crosswalk, and um, if the bus is stopped there so that um, cars have sufficient stopping sight distance when they're making that turn. And Corinne can go into the um, more detailed portions. Um, but the, um, the, the one thing I do want to bring up is at this, at the particular location, Otis and Broad Cove, we're, we're very um, concerned about that location because we do know that there's a disabled bus rider who lives right across the street, and we want to ensure that she is able to sit, get on the bus, get an on and off the bus safely. Um, so a couple elements of an accessible bus stop um, is a landing area. The landing area is the area where the, the bus ramp actually folds out. Um, it needs to be eight foot by 10 foot. Um, it can be eight foot by five foot, but ideally it would be eight foot by 10 foot. And then there's a clear zone, which is where the back doors of the bus open to allow people to get on and off in that location. Um, and then for the bus stop to be considered truly accessible, it has to have an accessible path of travel, which would mean that someone who is disabled getting on or off at the bus stop would be able to get to another location. So they wouldn't be stranded in that location. The current bus stops um, would strand um, a, a disabled rider because they're essentially a grass strip on the side of the road um, and there's no safe place to cross. Um, so I think that that sums up the PADI project and then maybe Corinne can speak to the details. Please. Don't start until you're up there. <laughs> <laughs> and then introduce yourself. Please. Good evening, everyone. I'm Corinne Tobias with Green International as the design consultant um, for these stops. So um, with respect to the um, Otis at Broad Cove Road stops, what we're doing there um, is we're introducing significant bump outs, which, as mentioned, significantly reduce the travel speed there, which um, a, you know a travel study showed that um, a speed study showed that people are currently driving at um, quite high speeds, you know, 40, 50 you miles do an that hour. Of course all not. Days, yeah, <laughs> um, but it really does. The the bump out will force people to to take that true right turn. And in addition, one other thing that was um, wasn't mentioned is that the bump outs also reduce the crossing distance for pedestrians, and so they won't have. Um, quite so long a distance to cross, and there will be a pedestrian refuge in the center island as well, um, so you can do it um, in half, so you only have to get across one direction of traffic at a time. Um, and in addition, I know there were some concerns about the, the visibility of the crosswalk as well, so the crosswalk itself has been moved down closer to the intersection, um, so that now it's visible, um, it will be much more visible from Broad Cove Road in addition to um, people already traveling on Otis Street. So um, with respect to the process we're you know, currently going through, we, we will have to go through um, mass DOT permitting because we're gonna be within their right of way. 
Um, but since we're taking over what, what's essentially part of their design for Route 3A, we anticipate that to be a, a fairly smooth process and we've been coordinating with them to um, make sure that we're meeting essentially their final design so that when they come in, it'll be a smooth process to finish up um, at that location. So those, those are the, the primary changes. Um, we think it's a big improvement with respect to speed, with respect to visibility, um, and also reducing the crossing distance for pedestrians at that location. Um, and yeah, that's kind of, that's, that's most of it for that stop, but I'm happy to answer any specific questions that people may have. Uh, anything you want to add with respect to the, um, the other location at uh, Governor Long Road? Yep, so for the Governor Long Road stop, that um, is on a much straighter section of roadway, so there were, were not nearly as many concerns there um, with respect to, to speed and safety. Um, we will be... Um, doing a little bit of landscape change, mainly the impacts will be to some of the landscaping there, um, but it will all be within the um, Hingham right of way, so we won't be impacting anyone's private property. Um, and in addition, the bus stop may help prevent people from sort of parking on the sidewalk, which we know has been an issue there and why some of that landscaping is in place. Um, you know, other than that, that's it's a fairly straightforward stop. We will still have the accessible landing areas and um, an accessible path across um, Governor Long Road at that location. So for both locations, is all the work going to be done on public property and not on private? That's correct. Um, I mean, one of the topics that the town of Hingham has been looking at, came out in our master plan process, is um, addressing accessibility issues. And this goes a long way, and uh, it is something that the town supports. Uh, so, so thank you. Liz. Yes, thank you for all of your work on this and, and patience with the process. It sounds like we came to a, a much better solution, so thank you. Um, are there any, JR, are there any concerns from residents that we, you feel like we haven't addressed? I think we've addressed them to the best of our ability. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, no, I appreciate, I know the safety concerns, um, you know, especially with that crosswalk were, were yeah. the main, I think, main points of feedback that we heard, so I'm glad those were addressed. Um, and certainly accessibility town-wide is, is a goal for us, so appreciate your help in, in achieving that. No, thank you. So uh, on Otis Street, so the, so the, the sidewalk, I guess, on the westerly side, of Otis, correct? And there's not, if my memory is correct, there's not a sidewalk on the easterly side. That's correct. That's correct. Right. So if if the if someone if the bus is stopping going north, and and someone in a wheelchair needs to get off the bus to get, I'm, I'm looking at the diagram here, needs to get to that crosswalk. Is there? It doesn't. Is there going to be enough sp space? on the side of the road for someone to, you know, traverse from the back of the bus to the crosswalk. What I'm, what I'm concerned about, once the bus leaves and continues northbound, is there enough, if there, if there enough side of the road here so someone's not exposed to oncoming traffic to get to the sidewalk? So the I'm sorry, to get to the crosswalk. So the sidewalk um, and that section will be redone all the way to the intersection? Are we, we're talking about Otis at Broad Cove here, correct? I just want to make sure I'm on the same page as you. I'm looking at the diagram on Otis. Yeah. Okay, yep. You see I'm talking? Yeah, this so one right for here. The, are you t the west side of the road? Yep. Um, so that sidewalk will be redone as well, and there will be a bump out on that side. Oh, so there will be a bump out to allow someone to, to safely get to that correct. crosswalk? Correct. There will be bump outs on both sides of the intersection. All right, and um, maybe for the chief or JR, has uh, Sergeant Kirwari, uh, has he endorsed the, this plan? Yes, yes. Okay, great, all right, thank you. So Liz asked whether or not this addresses uh, concerns of members of the public. Are there any members of the public who have comments or questions concerning the proposals both at Otis Street and Governor Long Road and Otis Street and Broad Cove Road. Yes, sir, if you can just come up. If you could, if I can stop you, if you can come up to the podium, please, and give us your name and address. Hi, 
none of us are used to this because of COVID. It's just it was a very different procedure. Thank you, sir. Yeah, hi, my name is uh, Takashi Fukuda. I am the owner of 139 Oti Street, where MBTA is trying to, to put to the bus stop. Just At 149. 139. Uh, 139, yeah. okay. Okay, then it uh, uh, sounds like uh, uh, the plan has changed. Okay, about one and a half years ago, the MBTA sent us this plan. Yep. And at the time, Okay, then uh, after that, uh, somehow the whole curb more uh, uh, larger uh, uh, radius, so on, so on. And so far, uh, no information uh, MBTA provides us. And we don't know the final uh, uh, plan. And the okay, original plan says, yes, so somehow trim our uh, uh, hedges and trim trees and so, so on, so on. But the uh, new plan, uh, is also included those actions? So, Jay, I thought that there was a public outreach and uh, meetings and plans were shared. There have been uh, several public meetings um, and plans have been shared at the traffic committee meetings. Um, those, uh, we did not distribute plan sets with this, um, with the abutter notice, uh, as that is not typically what we do with the butter notices themselves, um, but I'm happy to share the final plan with you at any time. Um, and I know Corrine has it uh, available as well. Yeah, but my question is about bushes and trees will be trimmed back? Uh, they will be trimmed back to provide space to allow the work to be completed. So to the extent that it's necessary, and those trees or bushes overhang um, the existing right of way, then they will be trimmed back to that extent. So, the, are we talking about trimming of, uh, let's say, bushes that are on private property? Well, where, where bushes or trees are planted on private property, but then extend within to, into the right of way with branches right. and such. Um, we would be talking about that kind of condition where in order to actually get the work done, we just have to trim back those bushes and then over time they'll come back. So this would not be a permanent reduction. This is to allow the work and then there would be growth afterwards. Correct. Okay. But that means so if uh, this corner the current corner is about this curve, and sounds like more coming down and mm -hmm. coming up. Is correct? Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. If so, then our property, our the whole, uh, bushes and trees are quite away from the uh, original plan. Then there's no reason to, to cut or trim. Is is correct? That is most likely correct. So to put it differently, my understanding is so if if the bushes and trees from your property are not affecting the construction activity, they would not be affected. This uh, answer is yes, no. <laughs> no, so I, I mean, I, I, don't, I, don't have, I, don't, I don't have a plot yeah. plan for your yeah. property, but. Yeah, actually, so me too. Uh, right. I don't have either. Yeah, therefore, I'm considered, yeah. Yeah, if they're set back from the road, I, they won't be impacted. How? Are, are you saying that yeah. they are set back to the, they, they don't overhang onto, onto the right of way? Uh, very uh, difficult to explain. Oh, sure. The current curve is about this, this line, mm -hmm. all this thing, the, uh, 3A, mm -hmm. about this one. Sounds like the, the uh, driving board coming out mm -hmm. more in this way. Correct. Mm -hmm. So it means uh, uh, the current line is uh, uh, out? So as a general rule, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. There will still be a little work that will approach your property line yeah. because of the we're going to be reconstructing the sidewalk. Yes. Uh, okay. Then uh, next question actually relating to that one. The sidewalk, current sidewalk along the water coming here in front of our property. Yep. Then goes uh, uh, in actually nothing uh, stopped. Mm -hmm. But this uh, side, uh, sidewalk will come out and extend it here, sur surrounding for a straight line. Correct. <laughs> okay. Straight line or a surrounding? It, there is a, a little bit of a wind to it because there will be 
two elements that come off of that. There's a, a primary element that goes to cross Otis Street. Here. You can see it better here. And here's your property. Yeah. And so the uh, first element of the sidewalk will yeah, so, yeah. cross here. Yeah. But then the regular sidewalk, a five foot wide sidewalk, will come means, here to cross your driveway and then. It means uh, not the whole, this sidewalk not coming out in this way. Not, not too far. Okay, then the, our uh, current, our bush is coming out here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this area. Then this area will be cut or somehow cut. So if I'm, if I'm scaling yeah. off of this drawing here, mm -hmm. I think we might be looking at a, about two feet of trimming at tops. No more than that. Two feet means about meet him in the field. But I can um, I can also meet you in the field and yeah, okay, and go uh, over it. Yeah, uh, if possible, if uh, you decide, then uh, uh, we'd like to, to have more carved and uh, in. Yeah. Okay, understood. Yeah. And, uh, next one, <laughs> the, you know already. Uh, the current zone uh, are carved stones uh, in front of 139. Yes. Actually, our, uh, privately, we installed. Then make sure those uh, carved stones should be kept. And after the, uh, 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 this uh, sidewalk inside, we install. Make sure. So you, correct? Yeah. You understand what he's asking? Yeah, he has a, he, they installed the granite curb in yeah. front of their house, and we had discussed this, I think, a year and a half yeah. ago, where we'll just locate it behind the sidewalk. Okay. Yeah. Got it. And the uh, last one, the uh, uh, handicapped landing, uh, landing space, somehow yeah. five, uh, eight times ten. So means eight feet coming into our property is somehow, though, it's possible, somehow reduced. So we're not on your property, it's all within town. Yes, I know, but uh, you know, uh, uh, in our street, most of uh, uh, our property is a straight line. Then only all, uh, on our uh, property coming inside. Right. That's, we feel somehow unfair. But it's not impinging on your property. Yeah, I know, I know, but the, uh, as a uh, uh, Ote Street uh, 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 resident, somehow, uh, normal street line comes here, all of a sudden, in front of our uh, property line comes in. That's uh, uh, our feeling. Yeah. So the, 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 the challenge there is that that's a necessity of making the stop accessible for the ramp that comes out of the bus so that wheelchairs can then access the bus or egress the bus safely and have a full landing area that's why that's the reason for the additional depth i know but the, the word safety is not absolute safety is safety and to know if i uh, must be so eight feet why not seven feet why not the six feet so that's actually can... an ada requirement the eight foot by five foot yeah. the eight foot deep is an ada requirement for the, for the landing area so there's so it is absolute yeah. So the, the, they, they do not have the discretion to reduce that. I see. Okay, and last question uh, uh, relating to that uh, uh, street line. The current street line already uh, in, inside because we intentionally put our uh, curb stones inside. We, we thought our property. We, will not, uh, we should not disturb the public street line. Therefore, intentionally a little bit uh, inside. Right. The uh, uh, current uh, final uh, uh, plan is the uh, uh, current uh, 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 curb stone line was a little bit up along to other uh, 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 straight line. Yes, the, we're not changing the alignment of the curb in the street uh, generally. The means aligned to our current uh, curb stone. Correct. It'll run parallel to the. Um, It'll, basically, it would run uh, parallel to the center line of the street, the, the sidewalk will. Yes, of course, uh, parallel, but the uh, other uh, street line goes straight. Then our uh, 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 curb stone about here. And you are talking about uh, the current lines along this 
our uh, curve stone line. I'm not sure I'm following the question. Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay, well, uh, the street line, all the street line, uh, other lines come to here. Yep. Then our curve stone intentionally we put inside here. Mm -hmm. Then uh, the final uh, uh, plan goes to around this other uh, houses uh, line or around uh, uh, our current uh, uh, curve stone line. So the the street side of the sidewalk will be along the existing curb line. So our curb, uh, curb line. Correct. Okay, not so along this street line. Well, where the where the curb is is where they're building, so they're not changing the width of the traveled way. Yes, but the uh, 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 street width from here is some, uh, for example, forty feet. But ours 45, for example, in front of our property. I'm not sure what the, the yeah. street becomes narrower as you go up the hill. Yes, no, not, not, uh, not necessarily narrower. So parallel here, yes, yeah. But uh, uh, we intentionally put inside, therefore now wider. Um. Uh -huh. Prep, prep, Natasha, can you? Yeah, I, I was just going to say, we can, um, if the, it sounds like what Mr. Fukuda is saying yeah. is that where they put their curbs doesn't line up with the edge of the road further on up. Mm -hmm. yes. We're more than happy to, to look at that, and if so, yes. slide the curb, yes. slide the, the out, line to so that it lines oh, okay. yeah. as long as, you know, yeah. as the 12 foot. Provided it's a safe travel lane, yeah. that's right. fine. Yes. Exactly. So okay. we're happy to look at that. So aligned with other uh, houses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for no. This was this <laughs> yeah. was important. Thank you for your comments. Are there any other members of the public? We'll do that. So my name's uh, Eric C. Schultz. I'm at 141 Otis. And uh, I've been involved, I know, asking a lot of questions about this, and I appreciate what you guys have done for the uh, traffic and so forth. So I do think it'll make a difference because we're right on that street, and it is a concern. My son's bedroom is literally right there, and so I can only vision cars getting around it and, and something bad happening. And so that's one of the main reasons why I felt like I was very uh, adamant about trying to slow this thing down. And so I do appreciate some of the, uh, the things that you've done. Um, also, I'd just like to say, um, obviously, uh, the, the ADA accessibility is, is an important thing, so I'm happy with that. The biggest thing that I, I still question, and I don't know, I know we've gone through it a few times, but it is the usability of it. And, and again, maybe this is something we take up with the MBTA, because the frequency and the ridership there is very low. And we've gotten a number of community people to sign documents saying that they don't utilize it as much. And so for me, I, I, I'm, I look at it as they reduced the number of stops um, last year, um, you know, and, and, and shifted it down towards us, or two years ago it was. And in, in, in our, I think most of the people on Otis and so forth were, th were thankful because we were thinking we're going to get a much better, um, fewer stops, um, less frequency, and instead we got, I think, an in to uptick in, in number of, of stops, but fewer ones along Otis. And so from that perspective, I think a lot of people were disappointed. Like if you talk to people within the community, I think they were very uh, disappointed from that perspective. And so we would, and again, I don't know, this is again, maybe talking to MBTA and talking to higher people up over there to listen to say, how do we reduce the number of stops to make it more efficient for people who utilize it on our street, as well as making it maybe more efficient if people just go like a direct route, like an express, like we said, straight, straight down 3A. And again, I don't know if this is the right platform or not, but I figured now is probably the time since we're talking about some of that. So, I mean, I can Please. respond to that. Yep. So, um, if you can MBTA, just go up to the podium. Oh, sure. Sorry. Thanks. Um, so, the MBTA right now is undertaking bus network redesign. So, now is actually the perfect time to address those kind of questions. Um, the um, the bus network redesign team is working on a draft plan, which will make some changes to routes. Keep, I think, something like ninety some percent of the stops will stay, but some routes will be changed. Um, but there is a public 
process period that is coming up starting in May. Um, the MBTA will reach out directly to JR to coordinate with Hingham. We'll be coordinating with every um, municipality in our system, um, but you can coordinate with um, JR and, uh, and see the draft map as soon as it's publicly available. I, I believe that's May 14th is when that's coming out. So, um, and then I think that that, I think that's really what you're asking about is trying to improve efficiency or yeah efficiency mm -hmm. and less frequent as possible frequency yeah it, I mean I realize that there's people who need to utilize it uh, you know efficiently throughout but I think there's also a way to cut out that elbow which might ridership for the coming from center and hang them all over the shipyard might be actually happy about that. so there's possible ways maybe um, if they did some studies okay that might work, so. yeah thank you Thank you. Thank you. And JR, I, I don't know if there is changes. Is, is, will that be circulated just to make sure that everybody gets to see a diagram, or how does that work? I'm not sure the process, just because we're so close. I just didn't know. If I, you, I think I saw the last one, but I'm not. If you've got sure. my, well, and there are going to be a couple more updates to this now just on the comments that we've just received. Yeah. But um, yeah, I'm happy to circulate them by email back to you or and back, back to you as well. Yeah. It's so. So, J.I., do you have their emails? I know I have Eric's, and I believe yeah. I, you have theirs also. Yeah, yes. So, so we should, you should just, when updates come, just shoot them out. Yep. And then, then you'll get them. Great. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other members of the public? Comments or questions? Yes, sir. If you, if you can just go. I need to get a go for them. Hi, I'm David McCarthy, 143 Otis Street. Just had a question on the, on the timing of this project, and um, especially about the bump out, because again, the bump out was supposed to be two years away, but it sounds like it's happening at the same time, which is, which is great. I think, um, and a related question around that is, um, you know, as, as we alluded to one of the other meetings, that that's, people go fast, no one goes 25 miles an hour down that street. So I go 25 all the time, and I get people right on my They're on your behind. rear end, yes. <laughs> um, so I, I, I don't think that's the town responsibility, but I don't know what can be done to try to maybe uh, more enforcement uh, from the state on that road or whatever, but uh, it, is, it is a, uh, as everyone knows and alluded to in previous meetings, it's a dangerous corner. And uh, my mother was calling 60 years ago to have it slowed down and it's still, still fast. If you, Natasha, one, sure. please. Um, yeah. So hopefully these improvements will make a big difference in the speed. Certainly as they make as they make the turn. Um, not don't know what they're going to do once they get around the corner. But um, okay. So in terms of schedule, we do still have to get obviously town approval. We also need MassDOT approval. That is usually not a super fast process. Um, I'm guessing. I think we're thinking two months for a MassDOT permit. Um, hopefully construction the end of summer or early fall. Um, but we have an on-call contractor as soon as we get approval from um, all the pertinent, so MassDOT and the town, we would be, um, we, it would go in the queue to be constructed. And what sort of notice would the neighbors get? Yeah, so point? our contractor will put up um, flyers or actually we'll just probably put flyers in your mailboxes two weeks prior to construction. Um, obviously, we'll, um, our contractor will also apply for a construction permit. Sure. I don't know if there's a drain layers permit, maybe. What, whatever permits are required to do the construction, they will apply for those in advance, dig safe, et cetera. Um, and then uh, two weeks notice prior to construction. Construction itself is pretty quick, although Otis at Broad Cove is gonna take a little longer because it's a much more complex right. um, construction. So I would say Otis at Governor Long is gonna take five to 10 days from start to finish to construct. I would say probably more like a month. Um, especially working with police details and um, on state, uh, within state highway for uh, managing traffic. Got it. Thank you. Great question. Any other member of the public? I think we are prepared for motion then. And I would make a motion to approve the request of the Massachusetts Department of Transportation to install MBTA bus system infrastructure improvements designed to improve accessibility at the intersection of Otis Street and Governor Long Road. The improvements include the construction and or reconstruction of concrete sidewalk, handicap ramps, granite curbing, signage, 
and striping within the town-owned right-of-way on Oda Street at the intersection with Governor Long Road. This approval is subject to the stipulations of the Department of Public Works as outlined in the letter dated March 4th, 2022. Second. Moved and second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. It's unanimous. Ready for the next motion. Thank you. oh, Thank you. You're not finished. One more. There is one more. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make a motion to approve the request of the Massachusetts Department of Transportation to install MBTA bus system infrastructure improvements designed to improve accessibility at the intersection of Otis Street and Broad Cove Road. The improvements will want, include one, reconstruction and reorientation of the intersection of Otis Street and Broad Cove Road consistent with the proposed construction planned for the Route 3A improvement project. Two, the construction and or reconstruction of concrete sidewalk, handicap ramps, granite curbing, new guardrail, signage and striping within the town owned right of way on Otis Street and within the state highway layout in Otis Street and Broad Cove Road. This approval is subject to the stipulations of the Department of Public Works as outlined in the letter dated March 4th, 2022. Second. Moved and second. We vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. That's also unanimous. Oh, thank you. Now, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, Natasha, Corinne, thank you very much. Thank and JR, you. appreciate your effort here. Yeah. He's next. Again. I know. <laughs> next item on our agenda is to consider approval of the traffic committee's recommended parking fine structure. And we have JR and we have Chief Jones. Uh, which of you will begin the presentation? The chief is getting up. Okay. Me. Okay. Is it here? Okay. And, uh, actually there. Be. Good evening. Good evening. So we're uh, before you tonight to ask, um, you to approve a uh, new parking fine structure for uh, parking violations of the town of Hingham. Um, the traffic committee uh, voted on these um, on a meeting on uh, March 23rd uh, and approved uh, to be recommended to the board uh, for the following changes. A fire department related fines which are parking within 10 feet of a hydrant or obstructing a fire lane uh, increase from the current fine of $25 to $50. Uh, proposal of increasing the uh, fine of obstructing a sidewalk and crosswalk from $20 to $25. And uh, increasing the uh, fine for the violation of parking within 20 feet of an intersection or over one foot from a curb uh, from $15 to $25. And uh, basically those changes will bring um, all the fines within, um, uh, you know, it'll just bring them up to the to the current um, uh, structure that all that they'll all be the same. So they're in groups. Uh, so there'll be the fifty dollar fines and then the twenty five dollar fines. Um, so the, we're also looking to add additional um, violations. Uh, one of them is is being uh, a vehicle parked uh, in a EV electric vehicle space. Um, in violation, so it's not an electric vehicle parking in that spot. That would be a proposed fine of $50. And adding the fine of uh, blocking a bicycle lane uh, of $25. And then adding the fine of parking outside of uh, the marked lanes of a parking space uh, for a fine of $25. So, Chief, I, I understand the, um, the new violations that are being added. Um, what is the motivation for increasing the fines for the, for the existing ones? Is it, um, are we finding that the existing fine structure doesn't work? Is this to simplify? What's, what's, the, what's the goal? So it, it's both. It's to simplify. Um, so it's bringing, uh, right now there's $15, $25, and uh, uh, fines, and then the, uh, the handicapped is, is $100. Uh, so it's simplifying, bringing all the fines into, into, uh, into the same uh, structure. Um, as well as the reason we're doing it now is we need to order new ticket books. So if we're going to be changing the, the fine structure before we do that, it would be the time to do it now. 
So if we do not approve, you won't be ordering new ticket books and no one's <laughs> going to get tickets. You just gave us an incentive. <laughs> we will be, but it'll be the old <laughs> structure. Um, but, but seriously, um, you know, making sure that public safety issues are respected uh, and that you know, the guidelines um, and the requirements that your department and the traffic committee have, have identified that they're respected, uh, that is important. Um, and um, I just want to make sure that, we're, that the fines that are being proposed are consistent with, with applicable standards. Do you know how this compares to our neighboring towns? Is it basically the same? Or? They are very similar. We did compare uh, these, this fine structure with uh, surrounding towns, and they, they all fall within uh, what Great. our uh, surrounding towns do. Thank you. Liz. Thank you, Chief. I was going to ask that, how we compare with our surrounding communities, so thank you for, for doing that. Um, no questions about these. One comment, though, I know some people are expecting to see the handicap um, parking spot fines, and the reason that's not on the list is that that requires a change in the bylaws, so we can't, we're not voting on that tonight. Correct. That would be a change in the town's bylaw. Mm -hmm. right. Correct. Any no else? other questions. Great. Thank you. No. Uh, so did the did did, did master in law chapter ninety twenty a and a half it allow for the increase? It does. Yes. Okay. Got it. Great. Thank you. And then the only other, nothing will change with the with the uh, late fee structure. It's going to remain the same as it as it exists right now. Okay. Jr. Is there anything you wanted to add here? Uh, no. Chief mm -hmm. Jones covered it. Are there questions from members of the public who are concerned about parking fines? We're going to get your names. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have one alibi question. So um, currently we don't have electric vehicle parking space violations, right? Those are all new. Um, right. So yeah. we, don't, we don't have one that would fit that specifically. There's um, one that we're currently use, which is restricted or prohibited area. Yeah. Uh, but to, to capture the issue that we're seeing uh, a lot more of is people parking in an EV spot that do not have an electric vehicle and, and taking up that spot, especially with the town's going to be installing new uh, charging stations right. around town. We thought it was appropriate to add a specific fine for that. And the bike, bike lanes are relatively new too, right? Yes, a couple years exactly. old. And um, outside the lines violation, is that a Mark Lane's violation or is? So it's if you're parked across two parking spaces, for example. I've got it. Yeah. Or on the side of the road, you're kind of in you're, the middle of the two. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Great. Well, Bill, I'm glad you brought up the EV space because we are getting new um, EV charging stations, and part of the grant uh, that is funding it is to make sure that we have appropriate fines, so that if people are parked there uh, improperly, that that there will be fines. So this is bringing us into compliance with the grant that the town is receiving to actually fund the EV parking spot. So thank you for thank you for doing that. You're welcome. Any other questions? Then I am prepared for a motion on this. Make a motion pursuant to Mass General Law Chapter 90, Section 20A and a half, and all other applicable laws. Select board for the town of Hingham hereby, hereby amends the town schedule of parking violations and fines as follows. One, increase fire department related fines from $25 to $50 for the following violations. A, within 10 feet of a fire hydrant. B, fire, line, fire lane obstruction. Two, increase obstructing sidewalk crosswalk fine from $20 to $25. Three, increase within 20 feet of intersection and over one foot from curb fines from $15 to $25. Four, add the following new violations and associated fines. A, electric vehicle parking space violation, fine $50. B, bicycle lane violation, fine $25. C, outside the lines violation, fine $25. Second. Moved and seconded. We vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Again, it's unanimous. Chief, thank you for the presentation. Next item on our agenda is to review the Lincoln School Apartments calendar year 2022 budget and capital needs assessment, the CNA update. And I believe we have Amy Farrell who's going to join us up here. 
and uh, Art Robert will, will be leading the discussion. Sure, just a, just a few introductory uh, notes. This is a follow-up presentation uh, to information shared in January. Uh, we'll hear about uh, the Lincoln School Apartments budget reflecting, uh, it will reflect some adjustments based on new information that I, I'm sure uh, we'll, we'll hear about this evening. More importantly, what we'll hear hearing tonight it really reflects the culmination of months of effort and focus on this facility and affordable housing, uh, including amending the lease between the town and the Lincoln School Apartments LLC, updating accounts and allowing the uh, million dollar plus windows replacement project to go forward, updating projections and procedures for the for uh, moving cash flow rent uh, from the project to the town and along the way transitioning some new staff a new zoning administrator and new land use coordinator that will allow us to enable a focus on on housing and do some long-term planning i think thanks are certainly due to leadership of the trust uh, board of managers the staff involved and certainly council in making this all happen thank you all right Amy. Um, I guess the first thing I'd like to do is call to order the meeting of the Board of Managers of the Lincoln School Board of Managers. And um, would you like an introduction to myself and the Board of Managers? You could introduce the members who are here. That would be terrific. Um, everyone is to my left. Um, Steve Spall, Matt Dillis, and Gretchen Condon. Um, there is one other manager member who is not here this evening, and myself, Amy Farrell, 95 Central Street, right across the street from the Lincoln School Apartments, <laughs> chair of both the Board of Managers as well as the Housing Trust, so I wear two hats. Um, we, if I can just interrupt, am I correct that we do not have a quorum for the Housing Trust here? That's correct. Okay. Um, I will, though, introduce the Vice Chair of the Housing Trust, Jack Falvey. Um, the Great. trust is the managing member of the yes. LLC, so it's important that both boards are represented. Thank you. Um, so I just want to dive right in after Art's yes. remarks. Um, we're presenting a couple of things this evening. The first is the calendar year 22 budget. Um, the, um, this is a practice that has been renewed and reestablished, and part of that um, renewal and reestablishment was as we looked at finalizing the um, contract and the lease amendment for the Windows Capital Project, which was done in, right. um, in November. And um, we have um, presented our budget in January. We voted at the Board of Managers in January, but we had one key item that was still pending, which was an updated and refreshed capital needs assessment. And that capital needs as assessment. What's You're fine. This is not great. But it's <laughs> oh. not your fault. <laughs> oh, I'm so, I'm so. We were trying to be helpful and put the budget up on the screen. It's a little bit scary. I'm a little. We squat. have it. We have I, it. Yeah, it's I have. There, I but, have everything. Uh, everybody has it. We have um, one. Ooh, that's yours. <laughs> I know. Um, <laughs> um, oh, I'm gonna, just going to go this way. Um, and and so we presented it so folks would have a sense of what the operations of the. Um, uh, the current year and then the proposed 22 year would look like but now we have the capital needs um, assessment completed right. and included yes. in that is a suggested replacement reserve annual contribution and frankly it reflects the amount of capital expected to be expended over the next 10 years and um, an annual replacement contribution of 300,000 versus 80,000 or 70,000 that was the prior contribution um, and so you know, I guess we can. What we can do is just walk through the budget itself. There's been no changes. Income is um, rental revenue, mostly, primarily um, receipt of the Section 8 subsidy. Um, the controllable expenses are pretty stable year over year. I will say that um, in this um, section, if you have significant turnover, you might see an increase year over year. So, for instance, 21 to budget to actual you see an increase and that's a reflective 12 reflects 12 units that turned um, the non-controllable expenses are holding fairly steady um, taxes rent and reserves are things that we care about this property pays real estate taxes to the town the base rent um, is a function of the ground lease and then you see the replacement reserve originally uh, up for 21 that was um, paid and then the increase in 22. 
Um, we come down to um, a calculation of after operating expenses projected cash flow and um, 21 is now actual and that um, cash flow rent or 90% of cash flow rent that $347,000 has been sent to the town as they say the check is in the mail um, I have confirmed that that's been cut um, by Corcoran and that's been the established practice for remittances via check um, but you will see the impact of the increased cash flow, uh, excuse me, replacement reserve contribution in 22 and the impact to that and the effect of reducing the projected cash flow rent. Right. Um, so looking at first under the expenses, mm -hmm. um, I see you had maintenance. Uh, the budget was about 80,000. Uh, projected was 120,000 for 20. Um, I mean, it, it's substantially higher, and then your, your proposed 2022 20, budget is, is back down. Um, and I just want to understand so, why that makes sense. Um, in 21, we saw, frankly, the vestiges of COVID um, maintenance um, right. tr uh, cleaning. Some of that's been backed ah, off, okay. but not all of it. Um, and then you also see some, some unit turn in from, is in there as well. And then the dramatic increase in the non-capital replacement purchases um, that's right below maintenance. I mean, you're, you're talking. That's to, that's exactly where you're going to see um, unit turns. That's the that's the bulk of it. Okay. Um, but are, are you comfortable with the 2022 proposed budget with, of the 63? I, I am. I am. If the unit turns um, are higher. And some of those numbers go up. Frankly, we can absorb that cost. It it would impact the bottom line. Okay. And no. So while we're on the budget, I know there's more to cover, but I wanted to give my fellow board members an opportunity for for questions or comments. Liz. Um, I we I've looked at this <laughs> with Amy before, but just to um, just about the maintenance. I know. Um, the trash removal and the dumpsters was a big item. Is that is that under maintenance or is that somewhere else? Uh -huh. Let me see where we. <coughs> In maintenance, you have um, public area contracts. Yes. <coughs> yes. Okay. Okay. Great. No questions. Bill? I have a couple of questions related to capital needs, but no. Yeah, right, just on the budget. Okay. <coughs> um, oh, sorry. So please. And then I guess the only thing, just a quick status as to where we are. I have a lot of notes here, sorry. Um, this, just to refresh everyone's mem um, memory, is a 60 unit property, 55, one bedroom, four two beds, and one studio. Presently, there's one vacancy. Um, there are there have been six unit turns year to date, so that's actually kind of high yeah. in three months. Um, and we, um, I just wanted to say, oh, they'll come to me. Okay. Um, what is your next topic? Because I may have a question on this before we. I think I'm done with the cap, uh, the operating budget, and so I guess that would be okay. So I, I just, for you. something that's not reflected in the numbers, not intended to, but it's of concern to I know your group and our group is um, how's morale, how how is uh, how are the residents doing, and um, I mean the numbers can be great, but if they're not happy, I'd like to know, and if they're happy, I'd also like to know. So I would say, in general, I feel um, folks are genu genuinely happy or generally happy. That's I think during COVID, there were some folks who were concerned about um, safety protocols because there was a, a range of safety protocols. Right. Some folks were very diligent in masking, and they brought their concerns to us. The Board of Managers um, purchased masks, additional masks for folks to, to have and um, then ultimately toward the end of the pandemic we posted signage done so folks were aware or reminded this was a town owned facility and what the town's practice was for mask right. wearing um, I think that impacted morale if you will 
because the public spaces were closed right. and um, the common area, there's a, there's a kind of a recreational facility um, on the first floor and that was closed and that was challenging for folks. Um, there's someone on site from Corcoran, um, they, have, they have a kind of an administrative person and then more of a custodial person and there's someone there from seven to five every day. They kind of overlap during the middle part of the day. And um, I would say that in general, I think people are pretty happy. Um, one of the things that may make them happier is that in this capital needs budget, we have money for next year budgeted for the common area and kind of generally sprucing up some of the interior spaces. And there's an expectation the residents will appreciate that. Great. Thank you. Was there, Bill, anything? Obviously, I know the Windows project was a big undertaking. What do you see as your next big capital need? Um, well, maybe I should just give an update on the Windows yes. project. So, um, a refresher, we signed a contract with um, a firm out of Bridgewater named Verica. They have 12 months from the time of the contract signing to complete the work. There have been a couple of on-site meetings. Art got a chance to attend one, so did JR. And, um, the windows have been ordered and they're in the fabrication process. We expect materials to be delivered um, uh, June, July period. And um, the second part of the order, if you will, is the windows are, are quite evident, but then there are the three entrance doors that include a lot of glass and those are also being replaced as well. And those will come within the same contract, but they are in the ordering and finalizing the specifications right now. Working closely with um, uh, Mark Coughlin at Strekolovsky, and um, I expect an updated schedule um, uh, values, not, sca um, not values, but um, calendar on um, the next week or so. Great. Um, next most important um, um, item is actually we pulled something forward into this year which is a replacement generator backup generator and that was something that Corcoran, Corcoran felt was pretty important um, given the age of the current generator and um, what could happen if it didn't work in the middle of the winter right. what's the status of that it um, th uh, the prime contact at Corcoran's got three names. I think he worked with Kathy Riley to get a couple and he's soliciting bids and then um, once we get those we'll move through a contract after we vote them. Great. Uh, one, um, just to follow up on a conversation Liz and I had about, as we think long term about capital and also net zero components of things, we gave a little bit of discussion to is there such a thing as a net zero generator and we came to the conclusion it had to work no matter what. And so it's going to be gas fired. <laughs> gas feed. And Amy, how's the elevator working? I know the elevators in the past, it's always been kind of a. Today the elevator's fine. <laughs> Today. Um, and, you know, maybe um, I did ask the folks at Corcoran to give me an update um, on some things. You know, what have we expended some funds on? And we upgraded the elevator in 2018. We spent probably another $35,000 last year on an electric panel. Um, so short of rebuilding the cab, all the, the guts of this thing have been rebuilt. Um, one elevator for you know the entire building can be problematic. And it ranges um, from things like, there was an electrical switch that just didn't work to uh, a resident standing in front of the door holding it. Um, and that can set right. it off. We had, um, uh, cameras installed last year and the cameras face the panel and the point is so that when the person comes to fix it they'll see what the panel last showed prior to the, the not working and that actually did have residents a little bit concerned they were like why are you spying on us we said actually no we're spying on your elevator and we're trying to make sure that that you know we understand what the panel is saying just before it goes out of service what's the useful life um, it's been essentially rebuilt, so there's an expectation that it, it will get us an, another five years. I don't think it's in the first five years of this capital plan, um, but that's actually the thing about capital. It's a plan, right. and it's not in cement, so things may 
you know, move around based on what happens. Um, so shall we move to the uh, next part of the presentation? Sure. Um, Your capital needs assessment. Yes, so um, just a little bit of background and um, this will be the third capital needs assessment that the town has done since we own the property. Um, capital needs assessments will typically project out 20 years. 10 years is a window that is kind of useful, but they're updated <coughs> every five. So we have one dated 2008, 2016, and 2022. Um, we, um, it helps us map the sequence of the repairs or replacements that we might do, um, but uh, always reserve the right to move things ahead right. in the queue. Um, it provides cost estimates that are the best available at the time, but until you actually bid something, you're unsure or unclear how true to the current market they are. Um, one thing that happened is we didn't accept that, we, we talked about this before we voted and accepted it, and Corcoran was quite involved in asking <coughs> some questions. And one thing um, they asked and was ultimately amended was the cost of, of installation and labor. And with our requirement to pay prevailing wage, we needed to have a, a a va to value that. So that's something that's included here. Um, the um, first year is the windows, and that's been bid, and so we have a cost. In terms of how costs have escalated, it's probably helpful to know that that line item from the 2016 capital needs assessment window replacement was for $300,000, and the bid came in at a million two. So. That, that's, that's, wow. You know. Okay. Um, but rents have gone up as well. So I think we really need to, you know, be um, mindful that it's, there is some um, balance here. Um, so to, to Bill's earlier question, this year the windows and a generator replacement completed by the end of, and paid for by the end of uh, 22. In 23, um, the next year is another $600,000 planned, and the big items in that would include um, some unit interiors, um, building exteriors, some of the mortar and the uh, masonry brickwork. Um, has there's some line items for that. And um, there's $200,000 for the common area. There, I can't read my writing. Um, and those are the major um, categories for next year. Um, the following years, it, this is a lumpy presentation, even though the replacement sure. reserve contribution is even. Um, the following couple years show a, a more modest contribution, but in 2026, uh, um, there's half a million dollars budgeted, and most of that's in the mechanical and boilers. Um, in 27 is when we see another $400,000, um, or 500000 to 400000 of that is the roof. Um, the other contribution or um, tool that this report provides us is a, a, a projection for a capital needs assessment, uh, excuse me, a replacement reserve account and contributions and withdrawals from that. So um, starting with this year's $300,000 contribution, they've projected out um, an annual contribution inflated, um, I think it's by 3%. And so that continues through the, um, the cycle of the capital needs. So the board voted um, to accept the amended, our board voted to accept the capital needs assessment at our meeting on the 28th. We also voted an amended um, capital uh, calendar year 22 budget to reflect the updated um, replacement reserve contribution. Um, you sat through a discussion with the MBTA on terms of improving accessibility. Mm. Um, is that a concern at uh, Lincoln School Apartments? Is that are you comfortable with where we are? So, in the current 60 units, there there are units that are accessible. The building itself is accessible because of the corridors right. and um, and the entryways are the entryways right. and the um, um, there's a, there is an elevator. 
Um, and, and but much of it's grandfathered. If this were built new, you know, there would be different types of specifications. And I've I've spoken with um, the architect to be concerned that anything that we're doing might trigger yes, um, exactly. more work. And he felt no at this point, no. Um, but he also did confirm that you know anyone that would come in, the the, the authority here is the town, and the town someone from the building department would come and make sure that. Right. Um, things were compliant, but we have accessible units. There are um, in the as you step from the newer building to the older, there are steps. So if folks have perhaps started in that older building and can no longer do the steps, what they would do is request okay. a reasonable accommodation, and then they would be moved to um, the um, more accessible newer part of the building. Great, Liz. Any questions? Um, can you just talk a little bit about the process for if, um, as things change, if something you know breaks or mm -hmm. you know, new we have to move things around on the need calendar? Need to move things around exactly. What what's the process for that? So um, it would be Corcoran experiencing, essentially, I would say, um, not satisfactory service from one of the major you know uh, panel breaks, and and we move something forward. Um, I don't know if what more can be done to the elevator, but that does seem to be the, um, um, you know, one of them. But it, that tends to be repaired, and that's an expense. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think what happens is then you push things that are not life safety related further out. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I would say anything mechanical or fire alarm related or life safety. If something seemed to not, you know, if there were concerns about that, that would get moved forward, and things like common area redecorating mm -hmm. would get pushed out to the later years. Sure. And that, okay. you know, that's not as appealing to um, residents, but uh, you know, it's what we're responsible for. But Corcoran, the management would company, that. they're yeah, they're our primary and first point. Great, thank you, Bill. Uh, no, it's, I know that you're going to have a lot of capital needs going forward, and it's good to see that your budget does have some money you can use to address some of these. I know you can't address all of them, but uh, it's good that you, you well, your, your budget's showing some growth, which is great. The, the hope is that there's enough in the cap capital needs and replacement reserve to mm. accommodate most of this. But I think the big variable is when we go to bid something, are the costs that are included in the needs assessment reflective of what current market pricing is. That is, the, I think, an unknown. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? No. Other than thank you and yeah. thank, thank you to the yeah. board, yeah. too. Thank you for all your great work. Appreciate yes. it. Thank you. Um, are you satisfied and is the board satisfied with Corcoran? You, you, I'm going to, um, I will go last. Okay. Um, but, um, and, and I will also say that I have, um, there's, I've been a, Conscript. I've, I've got some relatively new members, and then we have our longstanding member, Gretchen. So I think maybe folks can just, you know, respond, you know, what I've they say. I've been involved in affordable housing for 30 years, um, and I, 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 so I've walked hundreds of properties. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Um, just so that everyone else can see you, if you don't mind coming up to the lectern. Thank you, Spall. Um, I've been involved in affordable housing for just shy of 30 years. I've walked probably thousands of properties at this point. I'd say Corcoran's doing a very good job. Um, as Amy mentioned earlier, some of the common areas just need a little bit of sprucing up, but they've done a very good job with what they have to work with. Great, thank you. Matt Dillis, um, Matt Dillis <laughs> I've known for a long time. I dragged him onto this board because Matt knows everything about construction that I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's a strong introduction. Uh, my name's Matt Dillis. I'm a registered professional engineer, civil engineer with uh, 35 years experience in commercial real estate, uh, 20 plus years specifically in multifamily. And I'm the guy who is tasked with, for owners and lenders and investors, looking at properties and doing uh, capital planning, but also uh, also sounding the alarm when I see issues with deferred maintenance, deferred capital. And I'm happy to say that while I'm the new guy, uh, the proof is in the pudding. The property is obviously well cared for. No significant deferred maintenance, nothing that's been pushed off. So 
It's good a, to see. That's a very strong endorsement. Yes, yeah. thank, thank you. you. Gretchen, are you willing to stand up? <laughs> <laughs> you didn't have a choice, so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm retired now, obviously, but uh, my career was spent in managing elderly housing, both for the Housing Authority and for the Friends Home in Hingham. Gretchen, if you can and, just give us your name. Oh, I'm sorry. Gretchen Condon. Great, thank you. Um, and Corcoran, I know how difficult it can be working sometimes with elderly residents who that's their whole you know, circle of life right there in that apartment. And um, Corcoran does a wonderful job. Their staff is, I, I couldn't be happier with them. But they've, so, there's some things that can't be helped, but they've really gone beyond. So we're happy. Great, thank you. Great, thank you. And in closing, I would say I've had the opportunity to work pretty closely with the staff that's been assigned to um, Lincoln School, and I've been really happy. Um, I'm high maintenance, <laughs> and they have been really good. So um, I, I appreciate what they've done. And um, we had to do some, some research and going back into the history of the property since it's been owned, and, and really they were very um, thoughtful and patient and frankly um, flexible as we, we pivoted how we would like to manage things and report on things, and they accommodated that. So I, I'm grateful. And am I correct that the their fee is what's listed as the management fees correct in the, in the budget great and i am not seeing any real material inflation in those so fees. they bid every uh, the the contract is up for bid every three years they're on the third year of a three-year contract um and so um they were the only bidder um last time we opened this up um and they do know the property well um, I don't know what their pricing will look like next time um, because there's been more time involved sure. this, this, this last year. But I'm hopeful that you know we've got our, our new operating module going and so we're going to be just fine. Great. So this is the time that I would typically ask for comments from members of the public. Um, I am not seeing members of the public <laughs> other than I see Susan Murphy here. So. <laughs> Um, so uh, this, this was a very thorough presentation um, and um, I know I speak for the three of us about really appreciating the work of the group. Um, Amy, you are their fearless leader, uh, but I know you are one of the mm -hmm. board and so um, your efforts are really very much appreciated and the board's efforts are uh, sincerely appreciated um, because Lincoln School Apartments would not be functioning as it, as it is today without, without this group. So, so thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Art, we have before us a, a proposed vote um, Mm -hmm. I can find my vote list. Here we go. Um, to um, to approve the budget, uh, could you explain w why this board is approving the budget? It's in the lease. Yes. And so the lease says that they present the the budget to us, and we are to review and approve it. Correct. Okay. So I am prepared to accept the motion uh, concerning the uh, 2022 budget. I will make a motion to approve the Lincoln Apartments LLC calendar year 2022 budget as presented pursuant to section 6.4 of the ground lease between the town of Hingham and Lincoln Apartments LLC. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Again, it's unanimous. Thank you. Okay. Great job. You can't leave until you... I am now adjourning yes. the Lincoln School Board of Managers meeting. Um, do I need a second? You need a second and a vote. I would like to entertain. That's, I, need, I, I can't make the motion. Would you like to make that motion to adjourn? And do I have a second? All in favor? Aye. Great. Thank you. We don't have to do roll call now. Okay. That's true. That's true. 
next item on our agenda uh, would be the um, appointments. I don't think we have any scheduled for this evening. Um, next would be an opportunity for members of the public to comment on items not on the agenda. Are there any members of the public with comments? Seeing none, Town Administrator Select Board reports, starting with Mr. Mayo. Not tonight, thank you. Michelle? Nothing this evening, thank you. Art? In the interest of brevity, I would say not this <laughs> evening as well. <laughs> Liz? I'll just make a quick announcement. Um, there's the public safety building tours tomorrow. Um, fire and police, and then the select board is planning on um, attending the Hingham Community Council panel on Thursday, April 7th. Yes. That's it. Bill. Um, the spring uh, sports started last weekend, uh, Little League and lacrosse and soccer and all those great sports we have in Hingham. I'm just reminded by all the great volunteers we have uh, in town that run all those great programs. So thank you to everyone who make that happen. Yes, and then Hingham Sports Partnership had a wonderful event uh, this past Sunday, um, well attended, and it really shows uh, the best of Hingham. And uh, it, it was hats off to the sports partnership. And so at this point, um, I would accept a motion to go into executive session pursuant Mass General Laws Chapter 30A, Section 21A6 to consider the purchase, exchange, lease, or value of real property, um, since I am declaring that an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the negotiating position of the town, and the board would not, conven not reconvene in open session. Is there such a motion? Second. No. Who's making the motion? <laughs> so move, or didn't you just make it? I didn't. I, would, I said I would accept that motion. <laughs> so Liz has just made the motion. So moved. And Bill and second. seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We go into executive session and the board will not reconvene in open session. Thank you. Thank you.